Welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Health and Human Services with the Secretary. Please take the roll. Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Here. Assemblywoman Garlow. Here. Assemblyman Gray. Here. Assemblyman Hafen. Assemblyman Hibbets. Here. Assemblyman Koenig. Here. Assemblywoman Newby. Here. Assemblyman Wynn. Assemblyman Orritlicker. Here. Assemblywoman Taylor. Present. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Chair Peters. And I am here. Please mark Assemblyman Hafen and Assemblyman Wynn present when they arrive. Um, well, thank you everyone for being here. It's great to see you all in our physical locations. And thank you for those who are watching on the internet. We're going to start with a couple housekeeping items before we move on to some bill introductions and then our hearings today. First, I'd like to remember, remind everyone to please silence your electronic devices so we're not interrupting folks while they're speaking. <coughs> Members of the public may choose to testify in a variety of ways, all of which are listed on the agenda. You may also submit public comment in writing either in addition to testifying or in lieu thereof. Written public comment may be submitted before, during, or up to 24 hours after the meeting's adjournment. If you wish to testify in person, please sign in at the table by the door and leave a business card so we have an accur accurate recordation of your name. If you do not testify, you may also want to sign in for our records in case we want to reach out to you on a particular bill. To ensure an orderly flow of discussion, all comments, questions, and responses, please must go through me. And also, please, committee members, remember that you must be recognized by me before you may speak. Additionally, I ask our presenters on the Zoom video call to leave your cameras off and micro so microphones muted until it is your turn to present, or if I direct any questions to you. When testifying in person, please remember to turn on the microphones to speak and off to listen so we can avoid a reverb. With that, we'll move on to our agenda. We have two committee bills right now. I believe we're waiting on two more. Um, yeah, I think two more. So we'll introduce these. If another one comes in while we're um, while we're in committee, we'll introduce those. If we we're gonna recess after committee, and then we'll do bill introductions on the floor if we have to later. But we're gonna start with these two bill introductions. Um, a reminder that uh, voting for to introduce a bill does not bind you to that vote at all. Um, it just allows us to introduce the bill on the floor. We will start with BDR 57652, which revises provisions governing prescription drugs. Um, can I get a motion? Thank you from Assemblywoman Gonzalez and a second from Assemblywoman Taylor. Are, is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, nay? The motion passes with those present. All right, our second BDR is BDR 39653, which revises provisions governing behavioral health. I would take a motion to introduce. Second. Thank you. I have a first from Assemblywoman Taylor, a second from Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Motion passes with those present. Thank you so much. Those are going to get prepared to be introduced this afternoon. OK, we're going to move into bill hearings. Let's see. We have the Assemblywoman Kasama in the, in the room. Hello. And I'm looking for Carter. Is he in here yet? OK, we're going to start with um, our first BDR, uh, our bill today, Assembly Bill 188, which revises provisions governing investigational treatments. I would invite the bill sponsor. Thank you so much. Good to see you today up to the table. Um, please remember to state your name when you speak, and you may begin when you're ready. Thank you so much. Good evening or good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. It is my privilege to be here. I am Assemblywoman Heidi Kasama from District 2. And I am here with my colleague, my senator colleague here, Orenshaw, to present Assembly Bill 188, a critical expansion of the current right to try law. This bill seeks to address the pressing issue faced by patients diagnosed with life-threatening diseases or conditions who have exhausted all approved treatment options and cannot participate in clinical trials. The Right to Try Act, both at the federal and state level, has long provided these patients with the opportunity to access investigational treatments. 
However, it is now time to evolve and adapt the law to the changing landscape of medical innovation. As we stand here today, advances in medical technology have led to the development of personalized treatments based on an individual's genetic information. These treatments are becoming increasingly vital for patients with rare and ultra-rare diseases who have been left with no other options. Unfortunately, the current FDA regulations are not well suited to handle these to handle these cutting-edge, personalized treatments, often acting as a barrier to life-saving medications that patients desperately need. It is our responsibility to address these shortcomings and create a more flexible and patient-centric regulatory framework. Assembly Bill 188 represents a significant step in the right direction. By building upon the success of existing right-to-try laws, this bill aims to foster an environment that gives access to the latest cutting-edge technologies, enabling patients to access therapies specially tailored to their genetics. Across the country, patients facing terminal illness have been able to access treatments that have undergone basic FDA safety evaluation, but have not yet been fully approved, all thanks to the right to try laws. These laws have approved and save the lives of individuals suffering from illnesses such as cancer, ALS, and now COVID-19. Medical innovation is rapidly outpacing regulations that were established decades ago for a very different era of medicine. The FDA's approval process was not designed with individual treatments in mind, and as such, it can take an unacceptable amount of time for these life-saving medications to reach patients. In conclusion, as lawmakers, we need to recognize and adapt to the ever-evolving landscape of medical treatments. By expanding the right to try law through Assembly Bill 188, we can ensure that patients in dire need have access to the most advanced, personalized treatments available without being hindered by outdated regulations. Let us put patients first, allowing them the right to try and fight for their lives. I would now like to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Senator Orenshaw, to give remarks, and afterwards, Naomi Lopez, Vice President for Healthcare Policy at the Goldwater Institute, will give remarks and go through the bill. Good afternoon, Chair Peters. For the record, James Orenshaw. I represent Senate District 21 in Clark County, and it's a real honor to be here before the Assembly Health and Human Services Committee. And I want to thank Assemblyman Kasama for uh, reaching out to me to co-sponsor Assembly Bill 188. During the 2015 session, uh, I was approached by constituents uh, who had relatives who were terminally ill, and many had to go out of state to try to get some of these investigational treatments. And in 2015, I reached out to the Goldwater Institute and worked on what was Assembly Bill 164 that session. And that was a bipartisan effort to try to help some of our constituents facing these dire, dire situations try to get these treatments and these medications. And looking at Assembly Bill 188, I am so proud of what it does and what it will build upon in terms of opening up opportunities for patients to get treatments that otherwise they might not be able to have. I think if you look at uh, the cost to travel out of state to try to, for, for so many of our constituents, it becomes very prohibitive. And I think that this bill goes a long way to try to make sure that some of these therapies and treatments would be here in Nevada for our constituents. So thank you very much for hearing the bill. And I'm very pl proud to be a uh, co-sponsor. Thank you, Senator Orenshaw, for being here. It's a pleasure to have you in the People's House. We will appreciate you being here. Please go ahead when you're ready. Can you turn your microphone? Perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Peters and members of the committee. My name is Naomi Lopez, and I'm the Vice President of Healthcare Policy at the Goldwater Institute, which is based in Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you for allowing me to offer my insights and expertise regarding Assembly Bill 188 as you consider this important issue, protecting the right to try to save one's own life without having to beg the federal government for permission to do so. The Goldwater Institute is a public policy research organization we work through the courts, legislatures, and communities to defend and strengthen the freedom guaranteed to all Americans in the constitutions of both the United States and the 50 state constitutions. Reducing FDA red tape to allow patients access to potentially life-saving treatments and allowing medical professionals to practice at the top of their education and training are important priorities in our organization's healthcare work. 
Today, we are experiencing a medical revolution. New and promising treatments are being discovered almost daily. Some diseases that were death sentences merely one decade ago are now chronic conditions. And in some cases, some have been cured. And treatments using a patient's own unique and personal genetic information, for example, are now a reality for some illnesses and very promising for many, many more. Unfortunately, the current clinical evaluation system was created more than a half century ago, and it was intended to test treatments for large groups of populations. Would we want to seek treatment from a doctor whose most recent information was from the 1960s or who was still using 1960s technology to diagnose a serious illness? Of course not. Today, we know far more about illnesses and diseases and how to treat them, which is why we've taken a leading role in the Right to Try movement. And over that time, we're discovering that diseases and illnesses can be very specific to individuals. For example, there isn't one breast cancer. There are hundreds. Just a few years ago, terminally ill patients were forced to endure the FDA's slow-moving approval process in order to access potentially life-saving treatments. Today, patients have new hope and more options under the original Right to Try law, which is now the law of the land. Thanks to the work of citizens and state lawmakers, including Nevada, Right to Try is now federal law and has opened new pathways for terminally ill patients to access treatments. Today, Right to Try is working. Dying patients nationwide have been able to pursue, with their doctor's recommendation and oversight, treatments that have passed basic safety evaluation but not have not yet received full FDA approval. It has improved and saved the lives of people with illnesses like cancer, ALS, and now COVID. Right to Try for Individualized Treatments applies this principle to the latest medical treatments. This proposed law does not change or alter the original law in any way. What it does do is it creates a new pathway for those patients whose rare or ultra-rare diseases are unlikely to have enough patients for a trial or enough commercial interest to pursue a trial today. And it would have helped patients like Kira Riley. Kira, the Riley family has three daughters. Olivia was just a toddler when she started regressing neurologically and physically. They had her tested and discovered that she had MLD, which is a very rare but devastating illness that affects the motor functions and neurological functions, usually of young children. Young children don't usually last, uh, don't usually live past age five or six. Since they knew this was a genetic disease, they immediately tested their baby, Kira. Kira was, was just a few months old and they discovered she had it too. There was no treatment, there was no cure, but there was something being trialed in Italy. So during the height of the pandemic, the Riley family who lives in the Phoenix area raised half a million dollars, relocated their three children to Italy so that Kira could try this gene therapy. I'm very happy to report that in January, Kira turned three. She is doing well, she's thriving, she's climbing, she's riding a bicycle. Very sadly, her sister Olivia is now in hospice care. They had to go to, they had to, go to Italy. That shouldn't, we don't, it doesn't have to be that way. You as lawmakers have the authority and responsibility to ensure safe pathways for patients like Kira Riley and many others. So similar to the right to try law for individualized treatments, this will have important and trusted safeguards to protect patients who are pursuing treatments. First, the law will require patients to have considered approval treatment options. Second, the treatment will have to be recommended by a doctor who is in good standing with her licensing organization, and they cannot be compensated directly by the manufacturer for prescribing it. Patients cannot be charged more than the direct cost of those treatments, but it certainly does not preclude insurance from paying for these treatments. Third, the patient will have to give written informed consent regarding the risks associated with taking this investigational treatment. And fourth, the treatment rule, the, the rules regulating these treatments and, and how this treatment is created and manufactured are governed by what's called the Federal Wide Assurance. This is a set of laws, rules, and regulations that already govern and have for decades these types of facilities that would be creating these treatments. Instead of trying to create a, a new regulatory scheme, we wanted to go with something that was already well known, has been tested, and would not require 
new, new effort and, and trying to test something that had not been done before. So I'd like to briefly explain the, what the law does section by section. The first section basically adds individualized treatment, individualized investigational treatment to Nevada's current law. Section two describes that the patient has to be diagnosed with a life-threatening or severely debilitating disease, which has to be attested to by their physician. It also, um, it also uh, does the, it basically waives the liability so that a private cause of action against a manufacturer or an investigational uh, treatment or investigational drug or product um, against any person involved in the care of the patient, as so long as they're following the law and so so long as they are doing, you know, they, they are acting in good faith, um, that that cannot be taken. And this was the same kind of language that was used in the original right to try law as well. And we also, um, in section, section three basically adds additional language regarding individualized indiv investigational treatments. And once we get to, um, once we get to section five, that does something similar. I'd like to talk just for a couple of minutes about what the federal wide assurance is and what it means. So a facility that is doing any work on human subjects has to, if they are taking any federal government money, has to abide by this set of rules and regulations. It's very comprehensive. So let's say for an example, there's a Nobel laureate physician who wants to create a treatment. They are not allowed to go into a federal wide assurance facility and make something. Just because they have a Nobel Prize does not give them that, that entree into the facility. What they have to do is they have to go through that facility's institutional review board and get approval from the review board to engage in activities within, within that facility. They also have to provide a treatment protocol. In other words, what is it that they're going to be doing with what they create? They have to be very explicit about what it is that they are making in that, in, in that facility. And the Institutional Review Board also certifies that all of the patient consent requirements have been met. In this law, we also um, make sure that, that as you know, a state, the state has authority over, over the practice of medicine. We do not want to do anything that would undermine the state's authority to go after any bad actors. But what we do say in the law is that if there is a physician that's acting, so, that, that it is abided by the law, that they cannot be solely disciplined for that. Of course, you can discipline them if they're not acting according to the law or if they're doing something else. But, but we want to just be very, very clear that with this, nothing in this law changes or undermines the authority that the state already has as it relates to the practice of medicine, which we think is incredibly important because you do have, uh, that, that is within your authority. Um, so I, I just want to close by saying that um, state law, you know, we're in very divisive political times, but there is, there is a way for lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to act in the best interest of patients. T doing what's right for patients has nothing to do with political party. It has nothing to do with where, how you vote. This is about making sure that your citizens have more opportunities to seek out the treatments that their physicians believe might be able to help them. Thank you very much for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions now or in the future. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, are there are questions from the committee. All right, Assemblyman Gray, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Assemblywoman Kasama. And ma'am, you guys, this is a, I was very happy to sign on to this one. This is a good bill. And you guys both answered my questions. First one was going to be about uh, about other trials and, uh, you know, what effect might happen there. And the other one was actually about the protocols. The question that I do have, though, that remains unanswered is will they have to report to any higher authority or the IRB or anybody um, about adverse reactions or positive outcomes? I mean, will they, will they, this won't be a study, but I mean, will they have to report their results at some point? Um, Chairwoman, Representative Gray, you Naomi can go. Lopez for the Goldwater Institute, for the record. So in answer to your question, will the results have to be reported? We do, there, there will be a requirement at the federal level that the Department of Health and Human Services promulgate rules and regulations around the use of right to try for investigational treatments. We did the same thing for the original right to try. The final rules were just promulgated this past fall. Um, and then as a matter of course, any adverse events um, 
must be reported to the FDA. This does this is this th this current proposal does not change federal law, and nor could it. And so that is still a requirement. Thank you, Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for bringing this bill. Um, I just have a question of how it works on the ground level and uh, what kind of docs we would be seeing uh, or what kind of qualifications they might have. And I bring this up because it's been something that I've been working on in my professional life, but also up here in terms of clinical trials and trying to get that uh, biomed sector built up here um, in Nevada. So I guess my question is, do, you, do we have to have docs in the state in order to not have to travel to Italy? who are actually part of a clinical trial and certified to do that for whatever medical treatment it is that our citizen is seeking. Chairwoman Representative Newby, Naomi Lopez from the Goldwater Institute for the record. Thank you very much for your question. So I think I'm gonna answer it in two, two I'm gonna give you two different answers. So the first answer is, any treatment that would be created or provided in Nevada would have to be approved by the Institutional Review Board that governs that facility. So um, could you have a physician that was unqualified seek a tr to make a treatment in the facility? Yes, absolutely. But the Institutional Review Board would tell them no. <laughs> so that would, that would not proceed. And so we have many layers of protections in this law to make, and, and, and like I said, these, are, these, these rules have been around for decades and they work, we know they work. Um, and so the same rules that would keep um, a doctor that wasn't qualified from creating a treatment last year would do so in the future. Um, and so now to answer your next question, um, I do, so from what we've seen from the original right to try law, um, we've seen a lot of innovations that we actually did not necessarily expect or plan for. But I think once you make the ground fertile, establish clear rules and really create that pathway, then you have innovators and physicians come into the space and actually create new programs around treatments for patients. And so I do think, and I would be optimistic, that having a law like Right to Try for Individualized Treatments would garner the attention of manufacturers and companies to establish new programs that are not in existence right now because the legal environment and the regulatory environment just isn't that friendly to that. And Chair, if I could jump in, James Orange, all State Senate District 21, to you and through you to Assemblywoman Newby. I think that this bill really will complement the teaching hospitals we now have in our state, in both parts of the state. I mean, I think about growing up here in Nevada, we had the the medical school up here in the northern part of the state, and you know, we didn't have medical school down south. Now, I think the opportunities for a bill like this to help in teaching hospitals that we have here in Nevada are just tremendous. You know, growing up here as a kid in Nevada, so many people, if they had a serious life-threatening illness, would try to travel to a center of excellence, whether it was on the, you know, on the coast or out in the Midwest. But here, now, we've got some of these centers of excellence here, and I believe a bill like this will help people you know, struggling to find the right treatment be able to possibly get that here. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Orton Licker, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your concern about access to investigational treatments. I think you're absolutely right. We need to make sure patients do have access. But I, I'm concerned because there's lots of concerns about this pathway, as I'm sure you know. And um, the FDA does allow expanded access for investigational treatments like this and other investigational treatments. According to one report, they uh, approve more than 99% of requests for access to investigational treatments, generally within a matter of hours or days. Um, what, what is different about this is, yes, as you pointed out, there's Institutional Review Board review, but there's not FDA, Food and Drug Administration review, which is part of the expanded access. I've served on Institutional Review Boards. They are, they are important, but there's a lot of concern in the profession and researchers that 
IRBs just don't have the capacity to do the job that you want it to do and that the FDA needs to be in the in the picture. So uh, I'd appreciate your giving some more explanation why you think it's a bad idea to have the FDA in play a role in making sure that these drugs really are safe before patients receive them. Chair, uh, James Orchall, State Senate Please District 21, if I could take a stab at that to you and through you to Assemblyman Orrant Liquor. Uh, my recollections, you know, of working on the bill in 2015 was the feeling wasn't that it was bad for the FDA to play its important role, but what I had learned from constituents, from people I was working with, was that even though there was the compassionate use exception that the FDA has and other other ways that people could try to work through the FDA, a lot of times we found it wasn't that fast. So uh, I'm, pl I'm pleased to hear you, you saying that things are so quick now, but I know in 2015 a concern was not that the, the FDA did not have a role, but that, that they moved so slowly that some of these treatments that could help our constituents weren't being made available to them. And I don't know if, uh, if you'd want to jump in too, but... Naomi Lopez from the Goldwater Institute for the record. Um, Chairwoman, Vice Chair. So I would like to point out that under the original right to try law in Texas before there was a federal right to try law, Dr. Ibrahim Delbasan, who was former head of nuclear medicine at MD Anderson, and at that time was trialing a drug at his own clinic for neuroendocrine cancer. He had cleared the formal clinical trial process and was waiting for the FDA green light, which can take about two years after completion of the trial for the final FDA green light. He had patients lined up for compassionate use, and the FDA told him he had to shut it down. They had enough data. He was ready and willing and able to treat those patients. So he used the Texas right to try law to treat about 180 patients with neuroendocrine cancer. Some of those patients were flying to Germany for treatment. One of those treatments was a VA veteran who mortgaged his house to go to Germany to try to save his life. These are examples of how the FDA falls short in putting patients first. I would also like to point out, you may not remember, but um, Representative King and um, Majority Leader Pelosi at that time sponsored a private bill for J.C. Hempstead. She was a twin with ALS. Her sister had already died. They were trying to get a treatment, an individualized treatment bespoke for J.C. for ALS. They, uh, the FDA said no. And they had to, and so, um, uh, so Representatives King and Majority Leader Pelosi ran this private bill. Now they were, they, that pressure forced the FDA's hand and they were able to move forward with the treatment. But it's these kinds of obstacles that, that the FDA will not tell you about. That is the reason that we do need this type of law. Two weeks ago, um, the, at, a, at, a, at a nationwide conference, um, one of the FDA directors basically said that because they didn't have the capacity to do more Zoom calls, they could not rectify um, small problems in applications to move a treatment into clinical trials in the first place. The capacity of the FDA is limited, but there's also the principle of whether or not a federal regulator should get a veto stamp over whether or not your doctor thinks that you should get a treatment that they think might help you. And so that is why we're moving forward with right to try for individualized treatments. We, patients don't have time to wait on the FDA. And as state lawmakers, you have the authority to move forward and create this pathway so that your citizens don't run out of options, so that they don't have to travel the globe, and so that they're not put in unnecessary danger of, of, of seeking treatment from people who aren't working in their best interest. Any follow up? Thank you. Assemblywoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to our colleagues from the Assembly and the Senate, and thank you so much for being here and for your work. I just have a question. You mentioned um, the state of Texas um, and, and kind of looking and modeling around what they've done. What other states are, are is it predominant across other states that have this, I, I love how you call it, the right to try? Well, as a cancer survivor myself, um, if I needed experimental treatment, I would have wanted to be able to try. Um, so I certainly understand that. So what, what does this look like in other states? 
Chairwoman Representative Taylor, Naomi Lopez from the Goldwater Institute for the record. Thank you for your question. So the right to, the original right to try law was passed in 41 states, including Nevada, before it became federal law in 2018. The current right to try for individualized treatments, which does not affect the original law, but cr cr simply creates a new pathway for individualized treatments, has been passed in Arizona. It is now law in Arizona, and we have in introduced it in multiple other states that are now considering it. A follow-up, Chair? Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so really, the indiv this individualization, which is clearly pointed out in, in, the, in the legislation, um, that's the newness. I guess to this, and it'll be going on ac across across the country. And just one more thing: it's Nevada. <laughs> I can, you're gonna get more votes. You're gonna get more votes if you say Nevada. Just a little tip for you. A little tip. A little tip. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, well, I was laughing so hard. I don't remember if you had a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are there other questions from the committee? Well, I have one. Can you um, give us, I know you briefly went over the criteria for patients as it's kind of written in the bill, but can you give us an idea for the legislative record of what kind of criteria a patient would have to meet and what the, the doctor's expectations of that patient would be prior to um, requesting this authority or, or being approved for the authority to do um, a trial treatment? Um, th thank you, Madam Chair. Naomi Lopez from the Goldwater Institute for the record. So. Under this current law, the patient has to be facing uh, life-threatening or severely debilitating illness. That is defined in federal law, and we use that in order to uh, create the, the, state, the state versions of the, of the legislation. Um, the patient has to have considered um, other FDA-approved uh, treatment options as well as uh, those uh, treatment options that are in clinical evaluation. The physician has to be recommending that treatment, that specific treatment for that specific patient and has to attest that the patient does in fact meet, meet the criteria for, you know, in terms of the seriousness of their illness. Um, and, um, and the patient has to also uh, provide informed consent. There are several layers of protection of conformed con informed consent, which, in, which is at the state level, but also through the federal wide assurance. So there are multiple layers, um, and so they have to also be informed of the risks to the, the, both the negative and positive outcomes as possibilities from the treatment. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, uh, last time, last opportunity. Any questions? All right, we're gonna move into testimony. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, we will begin with support testimony in our physical locations and then move to the phones. We'll open support testimony on assembly bill 188, please come up to the table. I would ask that you state your name for the record before speaking. I wrote the light, there's a little um, button that says MIC that you can push before speaking. Uh, you may begin when you're ready. Hello, uh, Chair uh, Peters and uh, Assemblyman and Assemblywoman. Thanks for this opportunity to speak about my own experience. Uh, my name is Peter Kasama, and uh, almost a year ago, April last year, I was diagnosed of uh, stage four stomach cancer. And uh, I've gone through uh, chemo treatments a uh, couple months. Then uh, uh, my own previous oncologist, uh, of course, uh, told me to go see a surgeon. Uh, they went to a surgical center. I was, uh, that time I was getting very weak and I couldn't even drive myself, so I had my buddy, Tony, Tony Cosentino, to take me to the uh, sur surgeon's office. And she said, um, by looking at the uh, film, you have uh, two dark spots in the liver outside of the stomach and uh, your lymph nodes is getting darker. So she said, we are not going to perform a surgery. You're too late. I, when I heard that, so what's ahead of me then? And uh, she said, enjoy your life and make an arrangement with the hospice. That was a death sentence for me. I remember after the meeting, I got into the car and I told Tony about that. And my friend Tony said, 
Peter, that really sucks. And uh, he and I cried in the car. I'm <laughs> sorry. Please take your time. In that time, we decided to seek some other uh, possibilities, and that's when we reached out to the uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center. And uh, Dr. Parikh changed my life. And the first thing he said was, Peter, we are going to incorporate immunotherapy along with the chemotherapies. He said, okay. He said, I had no idea. Of course, I said, yes, please do. Uh, that really turned around in such a short period of time. Almost two months or three months later, I was ordered to take the CAT scan. And uh, when he saw that picture, he was going, wow, I cannot believe this. The darkness and also two dark spots in the uh, liver has almost disappeared. And the activities around the peripheral of my tumor in my stomach, which was a six by eight uh, with almost like an inch thick tumor, uh, the activities around the perimeter of the uh, tumor had subsided. So he was very, very happy about the results. And um, we continued the same treatment uh, combination of a chemo and the immunotherapy for another couple months. And this time, he ordered to take a, a PET scan. And that time, the two dark spots in my liver has totally gone. And the darkness of my lymph nodes are gone. And uh, so then he ordered that, that I should get the um, endoscopy, uh, stick, my tu uh, stick a tube in my throat and um, uh, I remember the day the, uh, Dr. Ryan, who performed the endoscopy, I was coming out of the um, anesthesia and uh, waking up a little bit. And he was right on my face and said, Peter, there's on, only four centimeter ulcer. There's no cancer. So what does that mean? I'm cancer free. So then, um, uh, about a week later, I met with the, uh, Dr. Parikh in his office and said, Peter, you are cancer-free. That was an incredible turnaround in such a short period of time. And um, I just thank you for this opportunity to talk about my own experience, which serves you as a sort of a real case example of how this new technology uh, saved my life, and I was able to hit the hole in one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kasama, for sharing your story with us today. Uh, it's amazing what technology is doing in healthcare, and the more we can expand access around who can access that healthcare, the better off our populations will be. Thank you again. We'll move on to the next um, support testimony. Please remember to state your name for the record. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Peters and the members of the Assembly Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Dr. Andrew Cohen. I'm here to testify actually on behalf of Peters' doctor and to the left of him, Helen O'Hanlon's doctor, uh, Dr. Rupesh Parikh. Uh, he couldn't make it today due to some last minute circumstances. Um, Helen will be testifying next as a patient of his. Um, I think Peters and Helen's cases illustrate um, situations that are very similar, uh, how they've been helped by uh, treatments that were not, um, that were individualized to them, I should say, that, and that uh, would not have been normally offered elsewhere, uh, but uh, had life-saving components. Uh, from Dr. Parikh, he would say, I'm here to speak in support of AB 188, which would allow and expand individualized investigational treatment for a patient diagnosed with a life-threatening or severely debilitating disease. 
New advances in precision medicine are rapidly altering the way physicians diagnose and treat cancer. The availability of biomarker testing that factors in a patient's genomic and cellular profile can now allow us to truly customize these treatments in a way that was not previously possible. Based on a patient's genomic and cellular profile, we can now determine that a treatment for one specific cancer type may be effective in treating an entirely different cancer type, thereby giving a stage four cancer patient more options to fight their disease and preserve their life. This was the case with Assemblywoman Kasama's husband, Peter. Helen O'Hanlon is also here to provide the testimony, as I mentioned before. She had stage four granulosa cell tumor. That's a rare form of ovarian cancer. According to Dr. Parikh, when I first met her, she was out of curative treatment options and about to go into palliative care only. She had multiple surgeries and further surgery had been ruled out. She had tried standard chemotherapies were, which were ineffective and caused multiple toxicities. Based on Helen's tumor makeup, Dr. Parikh and Dr. Curtis determined that they, it would respond to a treatment called stereotactic radiation therapy with the cyber knife. Even though this type of treatment hadn't been used for on her specific cancer type, extrapolating from other tumor types that have responded, they felt that it could potentially work for the eight tumors that were debilitating her body at that time. The problem at the time was that the cyber knife was not yet considered a proven treatment for Helen's type of cancer. But after some convincing, Helen agreed to the cyber knife procedure and it worked miracles. To date, Helen has had three cyber knife procedures which eliminated all her existing tumors and there have been zero new tumors since then. In the past, she had a dozen surgeries with the last one nearly killing her before she ever came to comprehensive. They knew that CyberKnife would be incredible, could be effective as it had been for similar conditions. In addition to CyberKnife, they also used a drug called letrozole, which was off-label and not considered standard in the treatment of the granulosa cell tumor. Uh, together with all their input, they went outside of the normal protocols and it apparently has paid off as she is free of disease at this time. So Helen's a great example of why it's, why it's important for a patient to have the right to try when faced with stage four cancer diagnosis. In Nevada, we need to think outside the box and continue to advocate for measures and laws that allow us to do so. We all have a voice and can generate many more success stories just like Helen's and Peter's. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony um, and for being here in lieu of um, one, uh, Dr. Parikh, um, I believe you said thank you. Please remember to state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Helen O'Hanlon. Good afternoon, Chair Peters and the members of the Assembly Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Helen O'Hanlon and I'm a stage four cancer patient. I refuse to accept there's nothing else we can do to save you as the answer, and thankfully, I am alive and thriving today. I moved back to Las Vegas in 2017 after I had endured seven recurrences of stage four granulosa cell tumor, a rare form of ovarian cancer. I had 12 surgeries to remove them and three different chemos. I ran out of options in Chicago, so I moved back home to Las Vegas to be around family and friends and to complete my life and my time here and die in peace. I relocated to Las Vegas, or I came back to Las Vegas. I needed to reestablish care and was connected with Comprehensive Cancer Center of Nevada. During a visit with Dr. Parikh, he urged me to discuss CyberKnife, a high energy X-ray machine that delivers targeted radiation beams that destroy tumor cells with his colleague and radiation oncologist, Dr. Dan Curtis. I, I, uh, initially, I didn't believe it would work. Um, I wanted to appease the doctor and go along with the consult, but I had been told there are no other treatment options. Um, and I had accepted my fate. Luckily for me, they were wrong. 
because I was able to try CyberKnife and it has proven effective for my cancer type. I never thought I would see my 50th birthday and today I'm 51. I still have cancer. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'll always be a cancer patient. Um, I have to take maintenance and therapies and monitor my situation closely. But the, for the first time since I was diagnosed in 2007, I have zero tumors in my body. I had all two doctors at Comprehensive for thinking outside of the box and for saving my life. I am an example of why it is so important that we support a bill like AB 188. Thank you for sharing your story today. I got chills while you were talking about um, what the Cancer Center is doing for patients. We would like to invite other folks who would like to share their support of the um, Assembly Bill 188 to the table. And as um, you share your support when you are finished, if you would step back so other people can fill in the seats, we can get through the folks who are here to, to support testimony in a timely way um, while also hearing all of your stories. <laughs> Please remember to state your name for the record. Oh, oh. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, and you may begin when you're ready. Annette Whittemore. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. I am the co-founder and CEO of the Whittemore Peterson Institute and a, a medical research institute located on the campus of the University of Nevada, Reno, which is dedicated to those impacted by myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, better known as ME-CFS, and similar post-infectious diseases. Our daughter was bedridden and homebound for many years due to ME-CFS, a chronic, complex, and disabling disease. It took two years and costly trips to multiple specialists to receive a diagnosis. During her most severe periods of illness, she had to carry someone to the bathroom, feed her liquid nutrition, and help her even raise her head. She had to be treated by an anesthesiologist for pain control. She became isolated from friends and other family members since she could not attend school or engage in social activities. Her illness became so severe at the age of 20 that her doctor suggested she receive two pacemakers, one for her heart and one for her stomach. Instead, she was able to receive an experimental drug that stimulated her own immune system to suppress the various viruses and pathogens that had become chronically activated. This was a clinical trial that she was able to access because we happened to live in Nevada and there was one doctor here that had applied and was doing a clinical trial. And there is only one other doctor in the United States that is also capable of giving this drug. So I, going off script a little bit, you can imagine what that's like for all the other people or the millions that are suffering that do not have that option. Under this bill, it would give other people the option to access this treatment without entering into a clinical trial and having to move to one state or another. Many others, although the drug was not a cure, it kept her hopeful and alive. Many others who are uh, refused access to medications take their own lives rather than live in darkened rooms to avoid the pain caused by light, starving for lack of food, isolated and in constant pain. Without treatment, these individuals lose hope of ever getting well. Tragically, people affected by ME-CFS have six, six to 10 times the risk of dying by suicide than the general population. Those who we know of who are severely ill and without treatment options are not that rare. They are just the tip of the iceberg. A higher risk for suicide was found when there is greater functional impairment are homebound or bedbound, physical isolation, are unable to work, and hopelessness from lack of treatments. There are zero FDA approved drugs for this disease. I support this bill because I believe that if it is within our power, we should provide individuals a chance to improve their health and to live with hope for relief from their suffering by allowing them to try medications which show promise for their disease. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for your time and attention to this important matter, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee. 
Thank you for your testimony. You. Please remember to state your name for the record. You may begin. Hi, I'm Dr. Beth McDougall, and thank you, Madam Chairwoman and the entire committee. It's an honor to be here. So I've been practicing me medicine for 25 years, and I began dealing with the most complex medical disorders. So in my career, I've seen so many people with chronic fatigue syndrome, and it's very disheartening to, to work with them because for some, their life is so small and it's limited to bed, and they need help getting to the bathroom and with all activities of daily living, and they really can't engage in life at all. And so what we've spoken about primarily today are life-threatening illnesses, and this is a life-debilitating illness that actually takes someone's life from them. So, so many times over the years, I've had to send people outside of the United States because, especially now in this era of precision medicine with immuno fingerprint testing that we can do, as well as genomic testing, we can identify precisely an immunomodulatory agent or, you know, perhaps in combination with antivirals that could help them in their situation. And oftentimes, those medications are not approved in the United States. So sometimes people have familial support and the resources and wherewithal to be able to fly somewhere else to get their treatments, and very oftentimes they don't, because very many of my chronic fatigue patients can't work and have been disabled for so long, they've long ago depleted all their financial resources. So to be able to offer them therapies locally is really a, something I'm passionate about. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Please remember to state your name. My name is Joshua Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and the entire committee for hearing the important details of this bill. Uh, we are living in a time of unprecedented medical innovations. One of the most exciting areas of development is personalized medicine. Thanks to new technologies, it is now possible to take an individual's genetic sequence and information and create a treatment that is tailored specifically for them. New technologies are bringing down the cost every year. For example, a patient's gene sequence 20 years ago was $50,000. 10 years ago, 10,000. Today, the cost is $600. This is fantastic news for, new, for patients, especially those with rare and ultra-rare diseases who have exhausted all other treatment options. However, today, the FDA's clinical trial system is designed for treatments on large tr populations and does not have an approval criteria in place to handle the treatment that is made for an individual patient. I emphasize that the FDA does in fact approve most right to try for new drugs that are in clinical trials. But this, it is not possible for the FDA to put a, a drug that is made for an individual into their clinical trial scheme. For example, a therapeutic cancer vaccine can be designed based on unique genetic mutations of that individual's tumor cell. But this treatment only works for that patient and no one else. The FDA's clinical trial system cannot handle this singular type of, of treatment. We must provide additional pathways that work in tandem with federal law and protections for patients to allow these personalized treatments to be accessible to those who need them. We must allow a more streamlined, patient-centered process that ensures safety, efficacy, while providing patients with access to life-saving medication. In conclusion, the Right to Try movement is about ensuring that patients have access to the treatment at the right time. This includes personalized medicine. Nevada can be among the first in the nation to modernize our healthcare system to keep pace with the latest advancements in medicine so that patients can benefit from these life-saving treatments. Thank you. Mr. Smith, are you representing an organization today or yourself? I am representing an organization. Do you want to put that one on the record? Um, the company I work for is Immunicore. Okay. Thank you so much. 
All right, I would like to invite other folks to share their support today. We have been in this meeting for an hour, um, and I think that there are quite a few folks in Las Vegas who'd like to share support as well. So if you have the opportunity to give succinct remarks, I would encourage it. Um, but I also don't want to dismiss folks' stories, so um, uh, please don't take it the wrong way, but we, we do want to, um, we do have two other bills to get to as well. So please remember to state your name for the record. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairwoman Peters and members of the committee. My name is Wiz Ruzard. That's W-I-Z-R-O-U-Z-A-R-D. I'm the Deputy State Director with Americans for Prosperity. And in the spirit of time, I will keep my statement short, but I will say I want to applaud Senator Orenshaw for, in 2015, opening up this opportunity for all Nevadans. And a round of applause to Assemblywoman Heidi Kasama for taking that torch and, and, and extending more freedoms to Nevadans with this bill, we truly believe in making not only Nevada an economic state uh, for more prosperity for all Nevadans, but we're talking about helping individuals reach their greatest potential. And although we're a grassroots organization that fight for freedom and liberty, we're happy to join and support this bill to help people fight for their lives as well. And this is what this bill is about, personalized medicine. We shouldn't relegate individuals to have to wait for institutional boards to review and pass something when literally minutes, days, yet alone hours are very crucial. When we're talking about personalized medicine, AB 188 does that. And I'm super proud, along with not only activists in the state, but the 40 plus activists that's in Las Vegas gonna testify and support, no matter how young or old they are, really recognize that as a state, we should be providing all the tools necessary to every single Nevadan who wants to wake up and give another fight before their end days. So I urge you to support AB 188 and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for so much for your testimony. Are there other folks in Carson City who'd like to testify in support? Seeing none, we'll move to Las Vegas. Welcome. Please remember to state your name for the record. You may begin when you're ready. Hello, my name is Eddie Diaz, Strategic Director with the Libre Initiative. We're a grassroots freedom-based solutions organization. Dear members of the committee, on behalf of our Libre Nevada community, some of them joining me here today. We would like to ask for your support for AB 188. We constantly hear from Latinos and other Nevadans who have a critical and life-threatening condition, such as cancer, how they try to look for different medical alternatives from outside the country. Unfortunately, not everyone has the time nor money to access this. We should not have to rely on other countries to get certain medical treatments. Instead, we should empower our state's doctors to be able to practice to their full potential. We thank Assemblywoman Kasama for introducing AB 188, which will allow terminally ill patients to work directly with their doctors to seek treatments without having to first, first get government permission. This would allow the doctors to work to their full potential and bring hope to patients and families. AB 188 can make all the difference for terminally ill patients that are running out of options. Alternative treatments could potentially save patients' lives by giving them the right to try. The terminally ill do not have time for political games. We encourage you all to work to remove red tape and political ploys and focus on working for patients' right to fight for their lives. These patients and their families are counting on our legislators to get to work and extend to them the hope they so desperately need and deserve. That is why we urge you to support AB 188. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just received the copies of the sign-in sheets from Las Vegas. We have five sheets of folks who, will, who are here to testify today, particularly on this bill. Um, and because of time, I would just ask if you can, you can um, uh, double down on um, somebody else's comments and say, um, say, I agree, that would be great. If you do need to share your story, that's also fine. I would just ask for um, the sake of time that we try and uh, not repeat other people's testimony. Please remember to state your name. Go ahead when you're ready. Hi, uh, my name is Christian Cardenas. I'm the Director of Grassroots Operations with Americans for Prosperity. Um, I would just like to say uh, I'm 22 years old and in good health. However, that could always change in an instant. My family has a history of cancer and diabetes, and that could potentially be a threat to me in the future. I know that there are plenty others that could be in that same situation, and nobody is prepared to face a life-threatening condition. But if we had to, and those that are facing it deserve every tool in the toolbox available to them. 
Individuals should be able to try treatments that are potentially life-saving if they make the choice themselves to do that. Uh, I know that if I was in that situation, I would be willing to try if I had no other options left. So I'm asking you to please support Assembly Bill 188. Thank you. Thank you. Please remember to state your name. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Molly Margie, and I'm here with Americans for Prosperity in support of Assembly Bill 188. In 2016, my mom was diagnosed with stage 3 double metastatic breast cancer at the age of 48. <clears throat> After going through treatment and multiple surgeries, she was able to beat the cancer and continue living life. Following this victory, we moved to Las Vegas. In April 2020, the cancer came back four times more aggressive than before. After a few different medications and chemo and radiation, nothing was helping. After an aggressive fight, she lost her battle on July 18th of 2020 only three months after her, first, after her second round of cancer was diagnosed. I realize now at the age of 23 that at the time of her diagnosis, I sh should have asked more questions and fought for her right to be included in other forms of treatment that would have potentially saved her life. That is why I'm here today. Although my mom did not have the available resources, I urge you to consider this bill as a means for more options to be available for those currently in the fight against cancer and other terminal Ill illnesses. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Please go ahead. Good afternoon and thank you, Chairwoman and Committee. My name is PJ Belanger and I'm in tears over her story. Um, I just put my hair back so that you can all see that I'm dealing with goiters on my thyroid. Um, they were huge, as big as a baseball, and I've been shrinking them all naturally. I turned 60 this uh, last birthday and I'm a candidate for something called ablation that's not available here in the United States. And I wish I was, because it would save my thyroid completely from destruction, and it would keep me, the, the, the actual statistics from, the, from, the, from ablation treatments in Italy, Germany, Korea, all these other countries that I read about have benefits for up to five years after one treatment. I would get continual reduction in size of these cysts on my thyroid that, by the way, I may not have a terminal illness, but are fatally risky when I choke because they deviate with my windpipe. No, I don't want my whole thyroid cut out. Thank you very much, but I'm not into being butchered. And then even if I did, it's a 50-50 chance of quality of life. But I'd be for sure a customer for the pharmaceutical industry for the rest of my life. These type of alternatives need to be available for people like me, for people with all sorts of different um, fatally, terminally restricting, debilitating illnesses. I've been battling autoimmune diseases my whole life, and I'm a prime example of what, when I used to teach, I'm a certified health educator, certified wellness educator, when I was diagnosed with the lupus earlier in my 30s. Um, you know, I've been helping people overcome sickness and disease naturally since I was 16 years old. Didn't know I was going to need it myself, right? But um, the thing I've learned is when the medical industry says it's incurable, it means we need to cure from within and I'm living proof. I'm 60 years old, I've been battling autoimmune diseases my whole life, all naturally, and I need to be able to have um, more, not, uh, more alternatives. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Amari Demiabara, and I'm a volunteer for American for Prosperity. Prosperity. I'm growing up in a family that has so many health problems. My grandma has suffered the most. She had two kinds of cancers in the fourth stage. She has been through so many treatments, old and new. She is now cancer free. There are so many new treatments that can help so many people. And I, for all those purposes, I support AB 188. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for the succinct testimony. Please go ahead when you're ready. Good afternoon, my name is Jesse Welsh. I'm a volunteer with Americans for Prosperity. Um, I might be healthy, however, several of my close friends and, fa and family members have dealt with cancer and other life-threatening diseases. Um, some have made it, unfortunately others have not. If there were less restrictions on more individualized care, perhaps, I'd, perhaps more important people in my life would still be around. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Please go ahead. 
Hi, I'm William Graham Carter. That's C-A-R-T-E-R -E for the record. Um, I'm here uh, partially with Americans for, Americans for Prosperity, and I have an uh, organization of my own called American Truth Alliance. Um, I'm here to support 188. I was blessed to be in Carson City uh, last week and see uh, Heidi speak. <laughs> I'm still in tears from her, her gratitude, and I, I got to see her husband speak uh, today. Uh, and I was in tears for that. Um, I think we don't need a... I, I believe I live in the United States of America, not the United Fed of America. And I'm, I have the Bill of Rights on my wall, and I, whenever I meet anybody in uniform, I thank them for their service, for protecting our rights. And somewhere we got the idea that appointed bureaucrats have more, more power than you elected people. I, I think it's a time that we took our states back. Um, I, uh, like PJ who spoke, I'm more into natural kinds of things. And um, I talked to a doctor who has a thing out in Florida. It's called Epiphany Medical. He charges each of his patients 80 bucks a month, and they get anything at the clinic. There's several doctors, all kinds of nurse practitioners. And uh, he went around to all the Steinbergs and all the, the uh, peripheral companies and said, if I bring you cl uh, cash clients, how much? 85% less. So there are different ways of doing things. Um, I have a uh, friend who 30 years ago told me that she'd gotten... Uh, I had just gotten my inheritance. She'd gotten hepatitis C on a one-night stand and wanted to send me to send her to Chipsa. It's a, a, a Tijuana-based, six-story serious hospital uh, based on alternative medicine, and uh, I might have done it, uh, but it would have broke me. And back then they gave out their protocol. They were the ones who came up with this individualized medicine of, of testing a person and coming up with a vaccine for themselves. And so I called down there, and the director, Dr. Dan Rogers, answers the phone, and he says, well, uh, I, hepatitis, uh, hepatitis C can be cured by hyperbaric oxygen. I know because I cured my mother. But in America, you can't get into hyperbaric uh, oxygen except for severe gangrene and things like that. He said, but if your friend can get scuba tanks and go down for six, 60 uh, 60 minutes a day, that'll do the same thing. So the FDA seems like more of a roadblock than anything else to me. I, uh, I, uh, I just, these bureaucrats are not accountable to anybody. They're elected, you are elected. And uh, I just, uh, I've, I've, I'm strongly, strongly in, uh, in favor of this and I, I hope, that, hope that you uh, uh, pass it, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I do just want to reiterate our time frame here. Um, and also ask that if you are able to ditto, ditto. Um, and if you are testifying, please stick to the bill at hand. Um, we do appreciate stories where the impact is uh, is relevant to the bill, but I would ask that we keep the, the comments succinct. Please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Zelaya. I'm volunteering with Libre and for purpose, I support AB 188. As someone who is currently not a doctor but is aspiring to become one, I firmly believe that everyone, that every individual should be given an equal opportunity to overcome their health condition. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Rigoberto Soriano. Uh, I'm here volunteering for Libre Initiative. And for I'm here, and for all purposes, I support AB 188. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jose Cortez, and I am a volunteer with Libre for all purpose. I support the AB 188 because. My family had a had a disease problem from from can, from certain kinds of cancer, and f last year, my grandmother um, was able to face all those struggles. Um, she won the cancer, but I'm afraid that that. It may st stroke, strike again. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Are there others who would like to provide support testimony on Assembly Bill 188? Seeing none, I would ask BPS to check the phone lines for support testimony on Assembly Bill 188.
BPS, are you there? We're having some technical difficulties. All right, we're going to put BPS on the back burner for a moment and we'll go into opposition testimony in our physical locations while they figure out what's going on. Um, I would uh, uh, open opposition testimony in Carson City. Is there anyone who would like to provide opposition testimony? Seeing none, in Las Vegas, is there anyone who would like to provide opposition testimony on Assembly Bill 188? Seeing none, BPS? Okay, still not connecting with BPS. We'll go into neutral testimony in our physical locations. Is there anyone in Carson City who would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 188? Seeing none, Las Vegas, is there anyone who'd like to uh, provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 188? Seeing none, BPS. <laughs> I hope we're streaming this webinar. <laughs> It would be really tragic if we haven't been streaming this whole time. <laughs> oh, uh, well, we are going to chalk that up to technical difficulties. I apologize for any who had been waiting on the phone lines or waiting for the phone lines. Um, please remember that you are welcome to send in any written testimony up to 24 hours after the adjournment of this meeting. I would ask the bill sponsor for closing remarks. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to all the committee members. Um, thank you. I, I didn't know we had so many supporters here, but I think it speaks to the passion that everybody has about this bill. Um, thank you for giving the time to hear this. Um, I'm grateful for the people that did some of the clinical trials to help bring some of these drugs forward that uh, Peter, my husband, and Helen could avail themselves of. Um, but if it had been a few years ago that I believe Peter and Helen um, had some of these things diagnosed, these treatments would not have been available to them. And we want these treatments to be available for somebody that is diagnosed last week, this week, and next week. We need our regulations to keep up with um, the fast pace that our medical treatments are, are moving at now. And so. The other thing I want to point out is the great doctors from the Comprehensive Cancer Centers and from the state of Nevada. And these great people did not fly out of state. They didn't go anywhere else because we have good doctors and we have good treatments in the state of Nevada. And it's my goal that we make sure we are no longer a medical desert, but we are a medical oasis here in the state of Nevada. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your consideration of this bill, and I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and close the uh, hearing on Assembly Bill 188, and we're going to take a brief recess while we figure out what's going on with BPS and people make their way out of the room. Um, we will get back at it, and hopefully quickly.
you. All right, welcome back. We are going to continue today. I am reconvening the Assembly Health and Human Services Committee. Thank you for that brief reprieve. We have heard from BPS that things are moving, moving again. We are going to take this last, or the second bill out of order. We're going to start the hearing on Assembly Bill 289, which enacts provisions relating to the natural organic reduction of human remains. I am particularly excited about this. I just recently listened to a podcast on uh, some of the work that's been done in other states around um, the composting of human remains. I'm looking forward to the hearing. Please remember to state your name for the record. Uh-oh, we're having more technical issues. We lost the, uh, we lost the presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chairwoman Peters. Um, my name is Max Carter. I'm Assemblyman from District 12, the east side of Las Vegas. And I'm here today um, to present Assembly Bill 289. It's about natural organic reduction, aka human composting. And what this bill is doing is enabling another method for the disposal of human remains or the final disposition. So um, as we know, we got cremation, which uses fossil fuels and creates greenhouse gases. Uh, traditional burial puts all sorts of chemicals and um, items that are slow to decompose. This process, as you're going to hear, um, here shortly, because I'm not going to talk very long, I'm just going to tell you that the main reason I'm bringing this, I'm very involved and very open about my work in the trauma and grief world, and this is a process that could possibly bring a little bit of light in somebody's darkest hours. And so we never know what it is that's going to provide solace, a little bit of comfort, and I believe this could be one of those things that possibly could. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Tom Harries to walk us through the bill and answer any questions. And also Chelsea Capurro next to me. Thank you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee for the record, Chelsea Capurro. Um, I will, too, speak very briefly and pass this over to Tom, but I do just want to preface this by saying we have coached him. If he says Nevada wrong, go a little bit easy on him, but he's, he's working on it. He's working on it. Brilliant. Tom Harris, um, uh, CEO and co-founder of Earth Funeral Group. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Chair Peters, and members of the Assembly Committee on Health and Human Services. And yes, I'm afflicted by a British accent, so if I mispronounce Nevada, uh, please forgive me. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, great, we've prepared a quick presentation. Um, there's a lot of uh, stuff on the internet about body composting, human composting, or the legal phrase for this, which is natural organic reduction. Um, so I wanted to provide a brief overview of uh, what the process entails and why people resonate with this as a process. Um, Assembly uh, Member Carter has given a quick sort of context to, to why this is relevant. Um, and just to add to that, burial um, and cremation are the two primary methods of disposition in the US. Um, burial puts all sorts of harmful pollutants into the ground, non-degradable wood, metal, concrete, and toxic chemical, which is embalming fluid. Um, cremation hilariously has been considered the more environmentally friendly option. Um, anything that uh, uh, uses fossil fuels, burns fossil fuels, and produces CO2 is not environmentally friendly, in my opinion at least, um, and produces CO2 equivalent to a 600 mile uh, car journey. Um, and actually, Nevada is about 81.6% cremation, so it's one of the highest, if not the highest, cremation rate in the country. Um, so what is natural organic reduction? Um, 
So natural organic reduction is an environmentally friendly alternative to burial and cremation, um, conceptually quite similar to cremation, but instead of being cremated and turned into ash, you're being gently transformed into nutrient-rich soil over a 30 to 45 day process. Um, at the end of the process, families are choosing how much soil they'd like returned. They can keep it, scatter it, or plant it in ways that are meaningful, them, for, meaningful for them. Uh, that might be a plant, that might be a memorial garden, that might be planting trees, um, or it might be scattering in national parks or any other places of meaning. Um, any remaining soil, there's about a half cubic yard to one cubic yard produced by this process, um, is sent to conservation land for restoration project, projects. So things like uh, reforestation, and wildfire restoration. Um, and the soil is serving as a means to return the goodness in our bodies to the natural world, um, instead of sort of being uh, blasted up into the atmosphere via cremation. Um, the science and technology behind this process is we are quite simply optimizing and accelerating nature. Um, the process takes place in a vessel. Um, this is a, a vessel from uh, Earth, you can see here. Um, vessels are controlling temperature, moisture, and oxygen levels. Um, the science, as we say, behind this is composting. Um, so what we're doing is creating perfect conditions for microbes to break the body down at a molecular level. And the output is nutrient-rich soil. Um, and just to, just to be completely clear, there are no chemicals used during this process, um, and there are no insects. It's completely natural as a process. Um, the process itself um, takes, uh, takes place in four steps, um, and you'll see the sort of gentleness and, and, and the niceness of the process as we walk through it. Um, so we start by gently washing and wrapping a body in a biodegradable shroud. Um, the body then gets placed in the vessel that we've just seen um, on a layer of organic mulch, wood chip and wildflowers. This is balancing carbon and nitrogen. Um, the body then uh, remains in the vessel for the 30 to 45 day process. Um, we are optimizing temperature, we're optimizing moisture, we're ox uh, optimizing oxygen levels. Um, and this is creating the microbial environment to break the body down. And again, the output is nutrient rich soil. Um, at the end of the process, from these two, how much soil they'd like returned, and the remainder is getting sent to conservation land. So a very simple, nice, gentle, natural process. Um, so why do people want this? Uh, this is gaining a lot of momentum very quickly throughout the country. Um, Washington state was the first state to legalize this several years ago and various other states have followed thereafter. Um, and there are several active bills this year as well. Um, but broadly speaking, this is a matter of consumer choice. Um, this is a perfect process for individuals who are trying to minimize their carbon footprint. Um, this is a perfect process for individuals who enjoy spending time outdoors and in nature. It's a gentle, natural process that returns you to nature. Um, and there are also a lot of people who simply do not resonate with burial and cremation. So we are providing um, a nice alternative to those people. Um, some of the key benefits are the gentleness of the process, the naturalness of the process. Um, it is net carbon neutral versus the 535 pounds produced in cremation. Um, and at its heart, we are restoring and protecting land for future generations. Um, I think the final bullet here got left off, but uh, talking about final resting places of natural beauty. And I think an example of this in uh, Nevada um, would be, um, would be um, Tahoe, for example. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to laugh, but Chelsea next to you is laughing. Um, the, yeah, and um, that's my presentation concluded. Thank you so much for the presentation. Are there questions from the committee? Assemblywoman Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I think this was pretty good, especially when I could visualize where you would be uh, putting the body. Um, I think my question actually has to do with um, if I wanted to donate um, uh, my vital organs, would I still have the option of this procedure? Absolutely. Oh, yes. Tom Harris um, uh, at the funeral group. Um, absolutely. Yes. Yep. Thank you so much. Are there, uh, I have Assemblyman Koenig. Are there other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. So I see how you're giving part of the compost to the family to plant in their garden and the rest goes to the conservation. What if I want all of my compost in my garden and not donate part of it to, I mean, is it, do we, does the person have to give half of their body to the conservation project or could they give it all to their family to put in the garden? Uh, Tom Harris, Earth Funeral Group. 
Um, you can keep all the compost if you would like it. Um, the reason we offer the option for the conservation land is a half cubic yard is quite a lot for a lot of people. Um, so that is uh, why that exists. But yes, if you'd like all of it, you can absolutely take all of it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go Gray Gorlo Hibbets. Gray, Assemblyman Gray, please go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, so many questions. Uh -oh. <laughs> just, um, I, I'm interested in, uh, I, I mean, I, yeah, just interested, do the skeletal remains break down as well? I mean, enough to where there's nothing identifiable, and do you guys remove all, uh, you know, medical hardware and everything and dental hardware prior to uh, returning it to the family? Uh, Tom Harris, Earth Funeral Group. Um, good question. Um, at the end of the process, uh, the bones, any remaining bone fragments are reduced to a fine powder and reintroduced with the soil. Um, bones are biodegradable, they're just very slow, so they do ultimately biodegrade. Um, any medical implants are re uh, also removed at the end of the process and recycled. That includes like um, mercury in yes. fillings and everything? Yes. I mean, mer mercury. Uh, Tom Harris, South Korean Group. <laughs> um, mercury um, during cremation gets sort of emitted along with the uh, CO2. So uh, this is uh, one, sequestering carbon in the soil, um, but two, avoiding any harmful emissions around CO2 or mercury or any other harmful gases uh, during the cremation process. Thank you. Uh, Gorlo, I have Assemblywoman Gorlo, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, this is really interesting. And I was just kind of curious, because you mentioned it's 30 to 45 days. So how do you know when the process is done? Um, you know, what kind of tips you off, something? Yeah. Um, Tom Harris, Earth Venal Group. Um, the, um, so we mod monitor the conditions throughout the process quite carefully. So as I say, we're optimizing temperature, we're optimizing uh, moisture, and we're optimizing oxygen levels. Um, because this is a microbial process, the microbes consume oxygen. Um, so once they are finished, um, the, the oxygen levels sort of don't dip. So we're able to uh, uh, monitor the process through sensors and computers. Um, and we know pretty definitively when it's done. Um, we also test the soil at the end as well. So we know that it's safe for humans, wildlife, plants, etc. Thank you. I have Assemblyman Hibbets next. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, first question I didn't see in the presentation, but I do believe I spoke to Ms. Caparo about it earlier, was uh, can you explain the cost of the procedure and the, the whole thing? Uh, Tom Harris, our funeral group. Yes, absolutely. Um, the we are active in Washington State at the moment, um, and uh, Earth, I can't speak for other providers, charges $49.50, so $4,950. Um, the average cost for funeral in the US, cremation and burial, is closer to $7,000. Um, but prices really quite vary. So um, you get a full range of prices. You can get some really low cost cremation as low as, let's say, $1,000. Um, you also get burials costing tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so price does vary. Um, I think price with this comes down over time. This is a new technology, and as uh, this becomes more mainstream, prices will, will come down over time as well. Um, but it's really not that much more expensive, or in many instances, more affordable than particularly burial, but also cremation. Thank you. My second question is just for the record. There's nothing in this bill that allows you to take your loved one in the backyard and bury them, correct? <laughs> um, so Harris, Earth Funeral Group, no. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Assemblyman Gray has a follow-up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is there any disease or process that would uh, prevent you guys from doing this with somebody that would, you know, absolutely restrict you from it? Yes. Uh, sorry, Tom Harris, Earth Venal Group. Um, yes, that's correct. Um, there are a few diseases that we will not perform uh, the process on people who have those diseases, um, but they're very rare diseases. They're things like Ebola and prion disease and stuff like that. Um, so 99% of people are eligible for this process. Um, the only other exclusion is if you die of a radiological accident, um, which again is pretty, pretty rare. But um, quality of soil out is quite driven by uh, the body going in and, and the natural materials that we use. Um, so there are, there are exclusions to who can undergo this process. I have an additional follow-up, and then Assemblywoman Taylor, I won't go to you. Um, so tell me about post, um, I don't know, uh, composting, testing of the soil, and what are you looking for in the soil to qualify it as being, like, ready to go to the family? 
uh, Tom Harris, Earth Funeral Group. Um, so at the end of each process, we are performing what is called a cell vita test. Um, this is common for composting. Um, so it's looking at CO2 evolution and ammonia. Um, and based on those results, we know whether the process has, has finished and uh, is stable and mature, uh, would be the technical words. Um, we are then performing additional testing to check for metal contaminants. Um, this is incredibly rare. I don't think of the 200 plus processes we've done to date since launching last year. Um, we've had a single instance of this. Um, so yes, the testing is uh, pretty thorough at the end of the process and it's very rare to find someone who uh, would not pass. Thank you, Assemblywoman Taylor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And this is, this is the interesting thing that you talk about when you're a legislator that you will probably have never talked about <laughs> at any other time in your, in your life. But this is very, very good. So thank you. Just a, a couple of questions, if I may, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, other states, are, is, this, is this happening in other parts of our country? And can you give us a little information on that? Tom Harris Earth Funeral Group. Yes, it, it absolutely is. So this was first legalized in Washington State in 2019. Um, Colorado followed shortly thereafter. Oregon, Vermont, California passed this last year. New York just passed a bill. Um, those are the states that have uh, approved bills and uh, have written legislation around this. Um, there are active bills in many other states. Um, I'll try and name some of them, but I'm not going to get all of them. Um, you've got Illinois, uh, you've got Massachusetts, you've got Connecticut, you've got Maine, you've got New Jersey, um, you've got Delaware, you've got Maryland. Um, I think New Mexico might have a bill. So um, there are a lot of places, and a lot of this is driven by grassroots uh, activism um, and consumers writing to local uh, uh, politicians requesting this because people resonate with this. Uh, it's, it's a nice alternative in many ways to the existing options. So yes, absolutely, this is happening elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair, for the, the second question. So how, what does this look like? So is there like a, a company and you go and buy a lot of or you build a something that you can house bodies in, you know, while they you know, decompose, for lack of a better. Um, how, what does that look like in practicality? Tom Harris, Earth Funeral Group. Um, yes, it's very similar to a crematory. Um, so crematories are typically in a warehouse. Um, and um, you have uh, a retort, which um, is connected to building systems, so power and uh, gas and uh, chimney and stuff like that. Um, so this is very similar to that. The process takes place indoors. Um, the vessels, you, you saw a picture of the vessel, the vessels get stacked uh, sort of one on top of each other for uh, space efficiency um, and remain there dur th during this process. So um, building systems for us include sort of a bit of power and water and, and uh, aeration and stuff like that. So really in, in, in buildings? Because in the crematory, yeah. the bodies aren't hanging around for 30 to 45 days, so. No. Um, yes, they, they remain in the, in the inside. Okay. It's an urban process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually believe in crematories, they often do lay around for um, a month or, or more. And during COVID, we actually saw that increase to um, up to 18 months in some cases. Um, I have Assemblywoman Newby next. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for this bill. Um, I was wondering, for the f grieving families, is there an uh, interaction or the possibility of the interaction of the family in this process? And if so, what is that? Tom Harris, Earth Funeral Group. Yes, absolutely. We, we, we consider this a direct swap out for cremation. Uh, we're not trying to change any ritualization at all. Um, so families can still have visitations beforehand. They can still have services before and after. Um, it is literally swapping out a, a cremation process for the natural organic reduction process. Um, and actually people engage with this process in new ways. Um, at our facility in Washington, for example, we have families who come and participate in placing the body into the vessel. Um, and they will often bring flowers from their garden. They'll bring handwritten notes, that sort of thing. Um, so it can be a very participative process if people would like that. Um, we're not replacing funeral ritual at all, ritualization at all. We're, we're offering a, uh, an environmentally friendly alternative to cremation. Thank you. Assemblywoman Gonzalez next. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I also have a few questions if that is okay. Um, just on the last question, when you uh, it sparked my question, if families have religious things that they would like to bury the person with? Is that part of the process or kind of like, what does that look like? Tom Harris, Earth Funeral Group. 
Um, the Anything that's biodegradable can go in the vessel. Um, anything that's not biodegradable cannot. Awesome. Um, and then my next question, in the other states, what, or like, do you have a number of how many people have used this and, and what that has looked like if, in terms of where the remains have gone? Uh, Tom Harry's Earth Funeral Group. Um, I could speak to Washington State, and um, Washington State, uh, I think the first facility opened at the beginning of 2020. Um, I think to date so far this year, about 0.5% of deaths in Washington have chosen this method of disposition. Um, this is very new, so I would expect that to grow quite significantly in popularity over the next few years. Um, but Washington is the most advanced state or has the most data at this point. And um, there's actually a, a report in 2020 by the National Funeral Directors Association um, that said that 4.1% of people would be interested in this as a process. Again, I imagine that's gone up quite considerably because the uh, press and media around this has given it a lot of attention since. Um, and we believe that if 100% of people knew about this, a very large percentage of people would choose it um, for the reasons aforementioned. So gentle natural process, net carbon neutral being returned to nature, that sort of thing. Thank you. And then in the um, process of, so the family gets to keep a portion and then the other or the, the rest would go to, um, sorry, I think it was in your power presentation of, of land or like projects. So in that process, so we were talking about like Tahoe, for example, is there going to be like a sign or anything that says that this was was like human remains that were decomposed or kind of like what does that look like in the real world? Tom Harris, Earth Funeral Group. Um, the example I can give again is in Washington State. Um, so in Washington State, Earth Funeral Group has a piece of land on the Olympic Peninsula, um, surrounded by trees, mountains, really quite peaceful and beautiful. Um, that is private land. Um, and there uh, isn't at the moment, but there will ultimately be a memorial stone sort of in commemoration of those whose soil um, is there. Um, so there are many different ways to do this, um, and we're not trying to trick people that there's uh, human remains there. So what would that look like in Nevada, though? Is this, is this buying a piece of land and that is where it is? Is it planting new trees? Is it like, what is the, what would that look like here? Um, Tom Harris, Earth Funeral Group. I think there are many different ways this could work. We've not thought too much to operationalizing Nevada first. Nevada, sorry, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're one step at a time. The first step is getting it approved. Um, but yes, I think the easiest path is quite often buying private land, um, and then there's no issue and no one can sort of be um, upset with the use. Um, but yeah, a lot of families use this on their own private land as well. Um, families can take all the, all the soil if they, if they wish. Um, it's not been something that's had any issue in Washington so far. Thank you so much. And my last question, um, in the processor that you use for bones, we, you talk about how it's the same as cremation. So I was just curious, in your opening remarks, you talked about the environment deficit that happens when we use cremation. So I was just wondering, is it different for your facility or process? And if so, what does that look like? Thank you. Uh, Tom Harris Earth Funeral Group. Yes, the big issue with cremation is that it's a fossil fuel driven process. Um, so we're burning natural gas to, uh, to, to, to perform this process. Um, so the emissions include CO2, uh, mercury and other harmful gases. Um, our process is completely natural. It's using microbes. We're creating perfect conditions. Um, in our facility, we use uh, renewable energy as well, and it's, 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 electric, uh, it's electricity, um, which makes the process net carbon neutral versus the 535 pounds from cremation. Thank you. Assemblywoman Gorlo. Thank you, Chair, for the second round of question. I'm just kind of curious. I'm assuming you mentioned that funeral directors would be the ones that would be doing this. What kind of training do they need in order to start one of these processes? Tom Harris Earth Funeral Group. Um, this is getting regulated pretty much identically to crematories. Um, so uh, CANA, Cremation Association of North America, provides most of the training in the US, or the uh, NFDA, which is the National Funeral Directors Association. Um, they are getting very similar training. So um, a lot of the training is around chain of custody to making sure it's the right body, making sure bodies are treated respectfully, et cetera, et cetera. So that is very consistent. Um, and then companies that operate um, themselves will give specific training to their equipment, um, OSHA training, that sort of thing. So um, it's very in line with existing training. Thank you. Assemblyman Gray with one more follow-up. 
Thank you, ma'am. Like I said, many questions, and actually this kind of falls on with uh, Assemblywoman Gorlos. So you've got to have a certification and a license to be, you know, to operate a uh, crematory, um, you know, to be even just to, you know, load them in and, and take them out. Is there, is the state going to have to create a new certification or a new class of uh, license for this? Because this seems a little more sensitive than cremation. I mean, at least with cremation, you can go back in and finish the job if need be, but just wondering if uh, the state would need to do that. Um, Tom Harris, Earth Funeral Group. Um, the way this bill is written is that this is broadening the definition of cremation. Um, this precedent was set a few years ago when alkaline hydrolysis was legalized. Um, so this is getting regulated uh, pretty identically to uh, cremation. Um, so yes, you need a facility license. Um, uh, people who work there have to be licensed operators. Um, so it's been, it's been sort of strictly monitored in much the same way that um, cremation, et cetera, are. And for the record, Chelsea Caparo, if I may just jump in a little bit here too. In section five of the bill, it says the board may adopt regulations prescribing requirements. So the board is also, the, the Nevada Funeral and Cemetery Services Board can also adopt regulations that they see fit to regulate this in the state. And Max Carter, for the record. Um, also, I want to follow up with that in that this is a very broad bill. It's not a narrowly ta tailored bill. It's put in place to enable anybody who wants to come in and bring this process. It's not tailored to one company. And also, you guys will notice that there is a two-thirds note on this bill, but the, it is, the fiscal note on it is zero. And it was done with the exact same language, exact same pattern as what he had just mentioned. Um, alkaline hydrolyzation, hydrolyzation, aquamation, which was done in 2017, and it did not have the two-thirds vote required on it at the same time. Um, like I say, the fiscal note on this is zero. An interesting clarification. You want to go ahead, Assemblyman Gray. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'm just wondering if legal could uh, maybe address why uh, there was a two-thirds note put on it. Mr. Robbins. Eric Robbins, LCB Legal. For the record, um, I will have to look at that and get back to you. Thank you so much for the for following up with us on that. Um, are there other questions? Seeing none, we will move into support testimony. I will go ahead and ask support testimony in Carson City. Please come up to the desk. And, and if there's any support testimony in Las Vegas, I don't see anybody in the room down there, but we're going to ask. Please remember to state your name for the record. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Isaac Hardy representing the Nevada Conservation League. Um, and, uh, we are in support of AB 289. In addition to the list of environmental benefits that we've heard here today, human composting has a number of benef other benefits. It is a job and business creator bringing a new industry to our state. It also offers a more affordable option than traditional burial or cremation, a more personal and meaningful way to dispose of a loved one's remains. We are in support of this bill and we urge the committee to support it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sarah Manns, Compassion and Choices, the largest national organization supporting everyone charting their own end of life journey. Um, and we are in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. To anyone else who would like to provide support testimony in the physical locations before we move to the phones? Seeing none, BPS, do we have you now? Hello, Chair. Thank you. Will you please check the line for support testimony for Assembly Bill 289? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers to testify at this time. Thank you. I'll go ahead and open for opposition in our physical locations. Is there anyone in Carson City who would like to provide opposition testimony on Assembly Bill 289? Seeing none, seeing no one in Las Vegas, BPS, is there anyone on the public line who'd like to provide opposition testimony on Assembly Bill 289? There are no callers at this time. We'll move into neutral testimony. Is there anyone in Carson City or Las Vegas who'd like to provide neutral testimony at this time? Seeing none, BPS, is there anyone on the public line who would like to provide neutral testimony? 
there are no callers at this time. Thank you. I'd like to invite the bill sponsor back up for closing remarks. Max Carter, Assemblyman from District 12. Thank you for listening to the presentation. And what we just saw here, what I just saw here is the same thing that I've been experiencing constantly since it came out that I was presenting this bill. Curiosity. And that's what we're trying to provide is just another choice for end of life. And thank you all for your consideration. Thank you, Assemblyman. Pleasure to have you in Health and Human Services today. We are going to move on to our last bill, which I am presenting today. So I will move my way to the front and pass off the chairship to Vice Chair. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And then let us know when you're ready and we'll discuss here the bill. Okay, I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 201. So I get that. Yes. Revising provisions relating to planning for the provision of behavioral health care. Welcome, Chair Peters. Please proceed. Thank you, Vice Chair Ornlicker and the committee. Thank you again for having me today to uh, uh, present to you Assembly Bill 201. During the previous interim, I was honored with chairing the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Health and Human Services, in short, the HHS Interim Committee. A major focus of the committee's work were issues related to behavioral health disorders and access to care for adults and children. We had two committee meetings dedicated to behavioral health for these populations, including substance use and treatment, crisis response, and systems of care, to name a few. However, I think behavioral health was pervasive throughout most of our meetings. It came up when we discussed chronic diseases, maternal health, when we received updates from the regional behavioral health policy boards. Even, we even considered it during a joint meeting with the Interim Committee on Natural Resources regarding the impact of climate change on mental health and well-being. Assembly Bill 201 is, is a result of the many productive discussions we had during the interim. To put this bill in context with other measures that you have heard or will hear, I will provi briefly provide an overview of the state of behavioral health in Nevada and the committee's work on behavioral health. As you have heard, Nevada, like the rest of the country, is witnessing a growing concern regarding the prevalence of behavioral health disorders in both adults and children. According to the Behavioral Health Barometer, Nevada consistently ranks among the highest in the nation for behavioral health disorders. Our state suffers from years of gaps in, the, in its continuum of care for behavioral health services. However, the Department of Health and Human Services has been working to develop a comprehensive continuum of care for those in behavioral health crisis, and we further these efforts with various legislation measures during the past sessions. To build on this work and to address the challenges in our state's behavioral health care system, the HHS Interim Committee voted on several bill draft requests that were introduced this session to address some of these challenges, and we'll sum summarize them quickly. First, we must acknowledge the significant shortage of behavioral health care providers. Many rural and urban areas in Nevada lack sufficient access to behavioral health care services. To tackle this problem, we needed to, need to invest in initiatives that encourage professionals to work in these underserved communities and promote te telehealth services to bridge the gap in behavioral health care accessibility. We have several bills in this, uh, this session addressing this severe shortage and to promote telehealth services. For instance, Senate Bill 119 from the HHS Interim Committee would make temporary reimbursement parity requirements for certain telehealth services permanent. Second, one of the primary areas for improvement is early intervention and prevention. By investing in school-based behavioral health programs, we can identify children struggling with behavioral health disorders early on and provide timely and appropriate support. Schools should collaborate with behavioral health providers to create safe and nurturing environments that promote emotional well-being. Related to this, the HHS Interim Committee voted to introduce another bill, Assembly Bill 237, to expand the stre and strengthen services at school-based health centers. 
Third, we must work to enhance and co the coordination and integration of behavioral health services with primary care. Integrating care can lead to better outcomes for individuals, reduce costs, and help streamline the process for patients and providers alike. This approach also ensures that individuals receive comprehensive care that addresses their physical and behavioral health needs. We already heard Assembly Bill 138, which is aiming to expand Medicaid coverage for behavioral health integration services, including the collaborative care model. Fourth, we must ta tackle the substance use crisis in our state. While our state experienced an increase in opioid-related overdose deaths to an all-time record of 566 deaths in 2021, we also saw a significant increase in overdo overdose deaths by substances other than opioids over the last several years especially methamphetamines, were involved with the, in the highest number of unintentional overdose death, deaths other than from opioids in both 2019 and 2020. One measure that intends to reduce the amount of harm by substance use and resulting overdoses is Assembly Bill 156, which this committee has also heard. Finally, we must provide the transition to, of Nevada's behavioral health care system to a community-based system of care model. The objective is to address the behavioral health needs, funding, and resources to expand access to behavioral health services across our state, especially for our children. State officials from DCFS testified last interim that youth depression and anxiety were <clears throat> at record highs. This increase in behavioral health disorders in children and adolescents coincides with a severe shortage of school personnel and behavioral health providers, which exacerbated the need for behavioral health interventions. As you know, the United States Department of Justice concluded an inquiry into Nevada's behavioral health systems last fall and found the state institutionalizes kids with behavioral health issues without a need in violation of Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. That is, Nevada relies on segregated institutional settings like hospitals and residential treatment facilities, among others, rather than offering children with behavioral health disabilities adequate community-based services. This is the reason that you, we are hearing Assembly Bill 201 now, which as introduced would establish regulatory clinical oversight of behavioral health care for adults and children and reinvest cost savings into the children's behavioral health system of care. This is the goal where we want to be and someday, someday intend to be. However, the limited resources and capacity of the state in this area require that we look at more feasible options. Subsequently, I would refer you to the amendment, which I will now go over. The amendment in front of you for AB 201 does the following. It deletes all provisions re requiring D DBPA DPBH and DCFS to make state plans on the provisions of behavioral health services. Instead, the HHS interim committee shall study the feasibility of a comprehensive state plan. It also revises the, so the cost savings and reimbursement provisions to require DHHS to track federal and state funding for the children's behavioral health system of care and analyze the annual costs avoided through such expenditures and directs DHHS to provide an update to the interim committee and prior to the next legislative session. To address the continuum of care, we included language to create a statewide, me statewide mental health consortium, which was set, out, set forth in Assembly Bill 273 in the first reprint of the 2021 legislative session. This is important because we will subsequently add certain members of the consortium to the Subcommittee on the Mental Health of Children and the Commission on Behavioral Health as set forward in NRS 433.317. In conclusion, the prevalence of behavioral health disorders in children and adults in Nevada is a pressing issue that demands our immediate attention. By addressing the challenges in our behavioral health care system and capitalizing on the opportunities for improvement, we can make a meaningful difference in the lives of countless individuals in our state. It is our collective responsibility to work together towards a creating a healthier and more compassionate Nevada for everyone. Vice Chair, committee members, I urge your support of 20, AB 201 and I stand for questions from the committee. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Committee questions? Yes, Assemblywoman Taylor, please. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair, and, and thank you, Chair, for the presentation. I have a question. I noticed on the uh, amendment, um, 
you, the, 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 the recommendations for there to be a requirement. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, item number two, to conduct an interim study on, on, on the feasibility of doing what you actually kind of laid out as the actual goal anyway. Can you talk us through that a little bit, the shift? Thank you for the question, Sarah Peters, for the record. The shift is predominantly related to the state's capacity and resources, that we, we want to be taking care of our children and the people in our state who need behavioral health care. We don't have the resources to put to it right now. Our desire is to ensure that everybody has access and that that access is in the community in which that person comes from and is supporting them in living a normal life every day or reestablishing what normal looks like for them. We don't have the resources to do that at the moment. And so I think that my goal with this particular rewrite of the bill is to create a pathway forward. Where do we start if we can't have the resource in place today? How do we get there? What's the path forward? Is it hiring additional staff? Is it creating a new division? Is it uh, the financial resources that we're really limited on are, which we, we know, this is an obvious, yes, that's a, that is an obvious, but what is the quantity of that, right? Is it tenfold? Is it a hundredfold what we exist, what we have in the existing capacity? I think the piece that's really important that we are directing DHHS to do, which is um, quantify cost savings. So we spend money in behavioral health care, right? And we know that spending money in preventative services and even in triaging services saves us money in the long run, right? We see fewer people in the hospitals when they're being treated up front for whatever it is that ails them. That cost savings, being able to capture that picture of how much we are saving um, as a state in providing those services for somebody, that would allow us to not just return that money into a, the general fund, right, or expand Medicaid in other areas. That would allow us to look at the quantification of cost savings in providing uh, preventative behavioral health services into the back end of additional be preventative behavioral health services. Um, but we need to know how to do that. And right now, quantifying that is a task that you and I can't do. But DHHS has all the people there to be able to do that. And they have fantastic data analytics. We've seen that throughout this session already to be able to capture that picture, tell us what it is that, that exists. And then the, the interim standing committee study will tell us where the best place to put that reinvestment could be to get us from the resource limited face that we're facing right now to a better continuum of care model. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you for your question. Assemblyman Hibbets, please. Thank you, Vice Chair. Chair? Um, so to clarify, the conceptual amendment, is that going to remove the cost in the two-thirds vote uh, necessity on this particular bill? Thank you, Sarah Peters, for the record. So the, so the cost would be replaced by DHHS's effort in uh, coming up with the, the um, tracking mechanisms for the cost savings effort. Um, that's not quantified yet, but it will be significantly less, I believe, than setting up a whole new licensure structure, which is what was propo proposed in the initial bill. The fee is related to establishing those certifying criteria or licensing structures that were in the original bill. And with the removal of that structure, the fee would be removed and the two-thirds would be removed. Quick follow-up, Chair? Yes. Uh, this is Go actually uh, more for legal. If we could have LCB follow-up and uh, clear or, uh, confirm that the two-thirds vote would be removed with this conceptual amendment. Uh, Eric Robbins, LCB Legal, for the record, yes, absolutely. The uh, fee is associated with the certification. So if we're um, taking the certification out, um, that, would, uh, that would remove the two-thirds fee. There is a part of the conceptual amendment that, um, provide, that talks about authorizing DPBH to certify inpatient behavioral health care facilities, but they already have the authority to do that, so it would be more of a clarifying change, so uh, that, that would not carry a two-thirds. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Legal. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. And now let's go to Assemblyman Wynn. 
Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. And I apologize if this was covered before I walked in. So uh, thank you for your patience on this. I just want to make sure I understand this. In terms of the dates that here is, is here on assembly, on the uh, amendment on number three, with the deadlines of being June 30th, 2024, and then again by December 30th, 1st, 2024, um, is this a one-time uh, schedule? And uh, are these data going to just be quantified for this one time? How... I guess my two thoughts in my head is that is that enough time for us to do all of this? Because you know that this data compilation is just going to be humongous, right? Um, and and do we have provision in terms of how this can be continued for, for some reason that these types of um, collections um, are somehow running behind or they need more time? I'm so glad you asked the question. Sarah Peters, for the record. So those dates are really to to drive, I think, to drive and clarify the fiscal note on this. Um, I, I think that once we set up a process to look at the uh, cost savings and the reinvestment structures, we will continue to do that in perpetuity, right? It just makes sense to reinvest in the system of care, especially since it's been ignored fiscally for so long. Um, however, you are you're uh, correct in that maybe that we should probably negotiate out a longer term standard, maybe every six months or so with an update. I don't anticipate these updates to be a comprehensive report and with an assessment of uh, and recommendations for the interim committees or for other standing committees um, to take actionable items. Uh, act, sorry, to make actionable tasks out of them. Uh, but I do expect it to give us an idea of how how things are going, right? So, so what are maybe some barriers? Do we not have the staff available to be able to do it? Um, and if we if we or, or it's easy to quantify the Medicaid inf investment, but it's harder to quantify the community-based investment. And so do we need to, s to create structures in which the community-based investment can be captured by some me mechanism? So it's more of a, like, ensuring we're touching base with DHHS and not just leaving them to collect data for no reason. Thank you, Chair. I think that really helps me understand it better. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Sure. Um, Assemblyman Hafen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and, and thank you, Madam Chair, for the presentation. I'm trying to um, wrap my head around the conceptual amendment today, um, and I, I think I understand the, the study portion, uh, but I think you know that I'm going to ask about the uh, statewide uh, consortium now being added to this. Um, could you explain why we're, we're doing this here instead of in the other bill? Thank you for the question, Sarah Peters, for the record. I, I knew this would come up because the consortium was not a part of the original draft of this bill. However, I wanted to make sure in this bill that we were talking about the commission, that in the original language we were directing to do the invest uh, investigation on cost savings and reinvestment structure. I still think that the commission will be an important piece. I'm sorry, I'm referring to the Commission on Behavioral Health. Um, they already are tasked in legislation, the legislation, existing legislation, to um, provide um, how to provide best best practices really in in the behavioral health care system, um, but I wanted to make sure that we were giving them the right um, committee members to address the children's behavioral health care that we were talking about, and in our uh, hearing on the um, statewide consortium bill, we learned that the statewide behavioral health consortium would really be where behavioral children's behavioral health care is um, is addressed and uh, having two members from that commission sit on the uh, from that consortia sit on the subcommittee on mental health of children that exists within the existing right it exists within the commi commission of behavioral health would provide that kind of um, connection that I think we were missing in the original drafting of the statewide consortia bill. I'm happy to talk to you about this um, outside of, of the committee to help understand what I, what I would like to do with 265 in this bill to try and marry them up together, but I couldn't put in here to include 
members from a consortia that doesn't exist, right? So I had to include the consortia to be able to direct them to provide those members be a part of the, con of the commission. Sorry, I probably should have started there. Correct, and thank you. That makes more sense that you can't direct um, something that doesn't exist. So I, that, that I understand, and, and I would take you up on your offer to discuss this a little bit further. So thank you, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, um, Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Madam Chair, for presenting this bill. Um, question for you. I, I too have read the Department of Justice report on our failings and uh, it strikes me that when you get a report like that from the Department of Justice it's really nothing to be trifled with, right? Um, and I know we're not the money committee but it seems like there's a lot of money right now. So um, have you heard any further on f any forthcoming actions or any next steps on that DOJ report and I ask that because I'm not only are we in a terrible situation with children's mental health right but I'm also concerned that our um, that our state is open to sanctions or to other actions um, through the DOJ or or other um, federal agencies if the, if we don't fix this soon Thank you for the question, and I, w I wish that this were a question that was more topical to this bill um, so that I had prepared for it, but uh, that's okay. I mentioned it in my statements, um, and, and this is in part due to the conversations we had in the interim related to that DOJ report. However, I also don't sit on the money committee, which I believe is where some of those investment the the subcommittee on health and human services in the money committees, right? That that's where some of the investment in making some changes that are really essential based on that report are being heard out. I think at the beginning of this uh, this session, we did hear from D, uh, the the um, Department of Family and Children's Services, and, or the division of, and um, and they mentioned a few things that they were working on, but I don't know where they're at in in their actual actionableness at this moment in time. Go ahead, please. To bring it back to the bill, how much do you think this planning effort would be uh, helpful in trying to address those shortcomings that have been identified? Thank you for bringing it back to the bill. Uh, I Again, I think that um, we, we have to make stepwise plans, right? In the state, we don't have buckets of money that we can toss at issues and come up with solutions in in whole, right? In our state, we end up having to do things incrementally and, in a, by, and we're scrappy by nature, right? Trying to find where we can have cost savings so that we can reinvest in, in other areas that are needed. So I think that this is really fundamental in how we address that step wiseness, right? Making sure that we're making the wise decision on where to reinvest in and also how much is quantifiable to be reinvested. So it may not directly, I'm not directing in this amendment that the statewide plan address our, um, the DOJ issues. That's really the state's existing charter, right? We have to address those issues. We were, we were, we were audited by the Department of Justice. It is, we are obligated to come up with a solution from them. But in order to not get in the same situation again, having a plan in place that says this is how we're going to get ourselves out of the situation that we're currently in and into a better sy system where we have planned for a continuum of care that is, um, that is uh, a, a living continuum of, of care that can address things as they come up. That will put us in a better position for any future issues that come up, as well as addressing the issues that we see as unfundable at the moment because we just don't have the financial structure to do it. Thank you, Chair, and for the questions from the members. We'll now turn to support and opposition and neutral testimony. Anybody here wanting to testify in support, please come up to the table.
Hello, my name is Vanessa Dunn with Bells and Case Government Affairs, V-A-N-E-S-S-A. D-U-N-N, -N, and I am here on behalf of NPHA. Um, we would just like to offer our support. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Pirro? Thank you. John Pirro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. One of the biggest things that we deal with in our job is the mental health issues that go unresolved in our community. Uh, if we could catch things on the front end, we would save a lot of money because we spend a lot of money on the back end in incarceration, in prison costs, in treatment. Uh, for those of you not on the Assembly Judiciary Committee, I say a lot of times in my job, I'm one of the first people to recognize that somebody has a mental health problem. And that's a long way to go through life where I'm the first person that catches that and then gets that person treatment. If we could fix that issue in our state where we don't have a lot of front end services, we'd be much better off. Uh, so I strongly urge support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pirro. Ms. Ra? Thank you, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, I want to thank the bill, excuse me, Erica Roth with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. I want to thank the bill sponsor for bringing this forward, and I echo, echo the sentiments of Mr. Pirro. Um, he's correct. We are very often the first person to recognize that our clients have been suffering with mental health issues or substance abuse issues. Um, and that's quite frankly just unacceptable. And the more that we can move upstream and address these issues on the front end, the better off this state will be. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roth. Ms. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, Joan Hall, representing Nevada Rural Hospital Partners here today in support and thanking the sponsor for taking time to listen to us incorporate some of what we suggested um, into our amendment. I still need to scratch out things and figure out what goes where, but um, we're in support. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Let's now turn to broadcasting services for support testimony. To testify in support of Assembly Bill 201, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon. For the record, Valerie Haskin, Rural Regional Behavioral Health Coordinator. Thank you, Vice Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'm here to, today to speak on behalf of the Rural Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board, who lends support to AB 201. Um, this was even before the amendment, and I am confident that they're going to like this bill even more with the amendment. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anybody else on the line broadcasting on, in support? Vice Chair, there are no other callers to testify at this time. Thank you. Let's now turn to back to Carson City. Anybody here to testify in opposition? Okay. Broadcasting anybody on the line to talk, testify in opposition? Vice Chair, there are no callers to testify in opposition at this time. Okay. Thank you. Anybody here want to testify in neutral? Please proceed, Ms. Jacob. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Warrant Licker. Joanna Jacob on behalf of Clark County, here supportively and neutral, um, just because I haven't had the opportunity to discuss this with the chair on this amendment. Um, I just wanted to did want to get on the record. Obviously, we've been before this committee and others about the needs that we have in children's behavioral health systematically um, in Clark County, and also, I would argue, statewide. Impacts of not funding in state on a statewide basis does impact us in Clark County also so we very much want to be part of this conversation as we work through um, the conceptual amendment and into writing it um, would like to have us be part of this information gathering as a county is not a behavioral health entity but as in a separate um, entity is obviously very involved this also does fit in nicely with a bill that we currently have pending in the Senate about another study before the interim um, health care committee about systematic um, review of our of our child welfare system so I actually think this fits very together very nicely and thank you chair Peters for your efforts on moving this um, ball forward so neutral today hopefully to move into a position of support as we write it up thank you thank you Ms. Jacob Ms. Adler 
Good afternoon, <clears throat> Vice Chair and members of the committee. I'm going to borrow that phrase, supportively and neutral. My name is Sarah Adler, and I am testifying on behalf of a couple clients, Vitality Unlimited and New Frontier, who are rural CCBHCs, and First Med, which is a federally qualified health center in Clark County. So. Um, I think if we had more time, we would be fully supportive of the bill as amended. I think the chair hit on some very key points, which is to use the Office of Data Analytics as kind of a hub point to really grasp um, investments and the outcome of those investments and use that to make best investment decisions. My clients would like to say there's a lot of planning that goes on currently that sometimes they're invited to but they don't have time to participate in because they're providers. So there's already a lot of planning um, going on. Uh, they um, see the value in that but at the same time they have needs for responsiveness from the agencies that would be part of this work that that you know uh, there's only so much time for a variety of functions of these different agencies so um, I feel at this moment that this hits a very strong center point thank you thank you Ms. Adler broadcasting anybody testifying in neutral vice chair there are no colors at this time thank you chair would you like any closing remarks only because I like to torture you with staying here for late hours um, on a Monday. Um, I just want to thank the folks who have come up in support, um, and we will continue to work on this amendment and make sure we capture the parts and pieces that are important to moving forward with the bill. Um, and I appreciate your uh, the opportunity to present it to you all. I'm very excited for where we're moving in the state. I wish we could be making greater advancements, but we are chipping away at it strategically as we do it in the state of Nevada. Um, thank you again, Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair, for your commitment to behavioral health. As you say, this is a really critical issue, and we're grateful for all the work you're doing. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 201 and stall while the Chair comes back to assume her responsibilities. Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you all for entertaining that. We are pushing our time here a little bit, but we have um, legal has a response on the question that Assemblyman Gray pet, um, stated earlier. I can't remember which bill number exactly, but I'll let uh, Mr. Robbins take the lead. Yes, Eric Robbins uh, the, from legal for the record. So this was a question about AB 239 and why there was a uh, two thirds requirement on the bill and Basically, as I, um, section four of the bill uh, allows a crematory who only performs natural organic reduction to uh, get a license as a uh, from the the funeral board, and so there are fees associated with that license. And so, basically, the I think that the theory behind the two thirds requirement is that um, people who um, without this bill would not be getting a license to run a crematorium would uh, with this bill would be uh, would be getting a license to do that and perform natural organic reduction and because of that there would be an increase in revenue necessitating the two-thirds requirement so not a new fee or tax it's just a new entity who would be invited to participate and I wanted to correct that was Assembly Bill 289, if we could correct that in the um, in the meeting notes. Um, we're going to go ahead and move into um, to public public comment. We will start here in Carson City and move to the phones. Is there anyone in Carson City who would like to provide public comment today? Welcome. Thank you for being here. Please remember to state your name for the record. You may begin. This is my first time doing a public comment, so bear with me. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name's Cecilia Dimino. 
I recently graduated from Harvard University where I earned a master's in human development and education and I've now returned to live in my hometown of Las Vegas. I live in 8015 and I had wanted to testify in support of Assembly Bill 294. I'd like my comment to go on record for its future meeting. While I was at Harvard, my aunt was diagnosed with stage four cervical cancer, which spread to her bladder. From 14 years old until the day she couldn't, she smoked cigarettes. She smoked throughout extensive cancer treatment, which was paid for by Nevada Medicaid. During her final month, she wanted at-home hospice, and I provided that for her as her full-time caretaker. In my hands, she agonizingly deteriorated until she was gone. She fought death the entire way. It was not an easy transition. And unfortunately, the cigarettes had had a stronger grasp and the addiction took her life. And to be honest, I had to dissociate throughout the trauma. But when I saw that AB 294 was being proposed, I knew I had to speak out. And my support of AB 294 is not entirely an emotional one. A few international tobacco corporations get to profit immensely while the state of Nevada locally foots the bill for their aftermath. It's such a scam. I urge the committee to protect Nevadans' health and the state's resources. Please mitigate this risk of major preventable losses. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And if you are able to provide that written testimony um, on the bill, we can include that on the record and, and when it is uh, heard. Are there other folks who would like to provide public comment in Carson City? BPS, could you check the public line for public comment at, the time, at this time? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Well, that was the end of our agenda for today. Thank you all for hanging in there for a long one. Um, our next meeting will be probably this out this evening. We're waiting on, I think, two bills still. Um, so I'm going to go into a recess rather than a, an adjournment, and we will adjourn on the floor. But our next official official meeting, where we will have bill hearings, will be on Wednesday at our regular time, 1.30. And with that, we're in recess.